afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for, for joining. We are going to kick things off, um, even though I think we're expecting a couple more people to join as we progress. Um, so welcome to today's webinar on British business expansion in Qatar and the opportunities within the Qatar Free Zone. So my name is Charlotte Booth and I'm the business development manager at Qatar British Business Forum, which is um, who is collaborating with uh, QFZ on this webinar. And I'm joined by John and Farhad, will, who will introduce themselves as they start their presentation. Um, so just to kick things off, I just want to share a few housekeeping uh, things as with all webinars, just to make sure it runs smoothly. Um, so the first point is that you will notice that you are not on video, which is good for some people, not good for others. Um, if those haven't had lockdown haircuts yet, you'll be think, saying few. And you are on audio, so it's only us as a speakers that can speak. However, you can see on the chat, I'm sure you're all probably quite familiar with Zoom now. It's our new go-to tool. Um, please do feel, feel free to chat on the chat and we also have a Q&A button at the bottom next to the chat uh, button where you can ask questions as we go along. And we do have a question and answer section at the end of the webinar where uh, Fahad, John and myself will also answer any questions you might have. So please just do that as we go ahead. Um, and as I said before, it is being recorded. so. Qatar Free Zone will be able to share that with us after the webinar. So just to kind of kick things off, I wanted to just introduce Qatar British Business Forum for those of you who don't know what it is. Um, I'm just going to spend, do this really, really quickly because I know that we have a lot of members who are on this call um, and know a lot about it, probably more than I maybe do as I only joined a few months ago. Um, but uh, QBBF has been established in Qatar for 29 years now, so we are very well established. And we are a non-profit or organization or business forum where we connect and promote ties between Qatar and the UK. So we are very much, we are set up in Qatar. All of our, our chairman and our committee are all based in Qatar and have got an extensive uh, range of knowledge and network across multiple industries in Qatar. And really we welcome members who are looking to either set up in Qatar, um, their British businesses in Qatar, or companies who do a lot of trade and business with British companies. So we have really strong connections with the British Embassy, the Department of Investment and Trade, um, and British Chambers all across the world. Um, so that's kind of what we do. And we, we currently have over 300 membership um, members in our, in our portfolio. And to explain a bit more about QBBF membership, we have two different options. So you can just join as an individual, so you as an individual could represent your organization, or we also have corporate memberships where um, up to five of your employees could join and be members of our organization. So we have, as part of joining the membership, you can access monthly luncheons, we have different events, uh, membership discounts, and it's a really good way to meet other people, uh, network, and also just kind of put your company's name out there. Um, our first event, as I was saying to John and Farhad, fingers crossed, is on 1st of October, uh, where our members will be meeting the new British ambassador and he'll be addressing us all. So we're hoping that goes ahead. Um, but yeah, so if you are interested in finding out a bit more about becoming a member for QBBF, um, my email address is bdm at qbbf.com. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a little bit about QBBF. Um, but I'll move on and hand you over to Farhad and John, which is the real reason that we're here today, who can explain a bit more about the free zones in Qatar. Thank you very much, Charlotte. Uh, my name is Fahad Al-Kawari. I am the head of market intelligence here at the Free Zone Authority. And, and I think um, given the, the landscape and the kind of uh, the format that we have here, I'm trying to keep, I'm, I'm going to keep this um, uh, as interactive as possible. So we will be bouncing ideas off of each other um, Charlotte, John, and I. Um, and uh, allow me, John, please do introduce yourself before I do present these few slides and start bouncing ideas. Thank you very much, Fahad. Uh, my name's John, and I'm the head of aerospace, logistics, and maritime. I've been with the Free Zone for just over a year. Wonderful. So this slide um, uh, in front of you, there are, there are two images. One, the, the man on the right uh, is Major Frank Holmes. And uh, he was employed by British Petroleum or the Anglo-Persian Oil Company as it was known back then. Um, 
to, to uh, help them out with their upstream ventures in, in Persia, or what is today Iran. When British Petroleum and other Western companies came to Qatar, they really didn't find any oil, uh, frankly, because I think they were looking in the wrong place or the geological sciences weren't advanced enough. So we actually call, or, or our grandfathers used to, call Major Frank's home, Frank Holmes Abu Naft, which means father of oil, because he took a, um, a big risk on Qatar. He took out a loan to buy the rights to explore, and he did it based on that rock that you see to the left. What you're looking at there is a rock that currently exists in Qatar, and it's, uh, it's called Khan. Uh, that's, that's why it says Dukhan limestone. And what he saw there was um, Eocene limestone. And what that meant to him was that there was some sort of hydrocarbon under it. And so he took that risk, and uh, lo and behold, in 1932, uh, he found oil, and Khan Field was, um, was uh, announced, I think, shortly thereafter, two or three years thereafter. Um, the current Qatar economy is based on uh, hydrocarbons, but before it that, so shortly after Frank Holmes discovered oil and the, everything was ramping up, um, we our, our entire economy was based on pearl diving. And those blue dots that you see to the eastern coast of Qatar are where people would dive for pearls. Um, shortly after World War II, the Japanese come along after they've rebuilt their industry and, and um, start producing synthetic pearls uh, in mass. And those pearls were of the same quality, if not superior, to these natural pearls, and of course, much cheaper. So the economy crashed in Qatar. Um, today, we actually utilize that same area to dive, if you will, for gas. So that's where our north field is. And we are by far the largest exporter of, of liquefied natural gas. So what the government has done is they've taken these gas revenues and created a, an array of, of, of companies that help us diversify the economy. And one of them is the Free Zones Authority where John and I currently work. And those, that is a picture of the two zones that we have. As I mentioned, between 1950 and 1990, we were very much a hydrocarbon economy. And um, gas was actually sold, uh, oil was actually sold differently then. We were selling it by the ton and uh, we didn't have much knowledge on how to sell it or for how much. So we were selling it in uh, either British pounds or, 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 or Indian rupees at the time, really anything we could get our hands on. And then between 1990 and today, um, the economic diversification plan began. So you find that Qatar Airways, Qatar Foundation, Al Jazeera, the Investment Authority, QFC, and others were created in order to become champions within their fields, not only locally, but internationally. And what we at the Free Zones do is take all of that and try to help them grow by linking them up with businesses that will also, of course, grow. Um, so we do take all of these competitive advantages that we've, that we've uh, built since the 90s and link them with prospective uh, investors or people that want to grow their businesses here in Qatar. And there are quite a few success stories in that regard, um, which we'll hopefully have time to discuss later. We do rank highly across a range of uh, competitive metrics, but the one I want to stress on is health systems. So we're fifth in the world when it comes to health systems because we are number one in the world when it comes to doctors to patients uh, as a ratio. Um, and we've been quite fortunate in that sense, given the current Corona uh, virus, we have uh, the second lowest death rate in the world uh, right after Singapore. And that's partially because the government has spent a lot of money ensuring that we have very high quality um, healthcare and the accessibility to healthcare is, is extremely um, uh, prevalent and free. So we're, we've been very fortunate in that sense. Of course, in addition to that, we're number one in the world uh, for internet penetration, third in ease of finding skilled employees, and fifth for venture capital availability. Um, so a lot of companies are, are very interested in those metrics. The free zones themselves, uh, there are two free zones, but before I get into those, I do want to stress that we are quite a sustainable free zone. So what maybe where we differ from other free zones is that we are very environmentally conscious and the end goal here really is a diversification of the economy um, in a sustainable manner. So the, the, the stakeholders in this free zones are neither myself nor is it John, it's, it's my children and their children. Uh, we don't look after profit. Um, because we are by default a government organization that's nonprofit. So we will avoid businesses that are very polluting or require a high amount of unskilled labor, regardless of what the capital expenditure is. 
on the other end of that coin or, or uh, other side of that coin, we welcome small businesses uh, that are innovative. Uh, we welcome businesses that that um, have a track record where they are um, growing and and even if the if the size of the business is small, um, anything that provides innovation, anything that brings sustainability is is beyond welcome. And, and of course, our BD team will look after those businesses on a case by case basis. There are two free zones. Um, and regardless where you end up, you are quite central. Qatar is a very small country, uh, country. So between the Ruwais port in the very north and the very south, um, it'll take you two hours by car. So regardless where you end up, you're quite central. Um, Ras Bofantas is the logistics hub and it's directly linked to the airport. And it's where, it's around four kilometers squared and it's where we uh, bring in our logistics companies, our emerging tech companies, light manufacturing, the aviation sector, and international businesses, uh, business services. Uh, a very big investor that has invested there quite recently is Volkswagen and they want to do R&D for autonomous vehicles. Um, Google is also um, on our investor list in, in Rasbo Fantas. So this, this is really where we put the high value um, investments when it comes to uh, a, a, a smaller need for space. So, so office, um, office investors and, and very high tech um, investors. Um al Hul is much bigger. Uh, it's around 30 kilometers squared, and this is where we put our heavy uh, manufacturing. So um, uh, heavy manufacturing, downstream chemicals, um, and the plots there are also much bigger. There is also, if um, uh, I'd like to direct your attention towards the Marsa port, and that's where we'll put our shipbuilding. It's a, it's a man-made port uh, with a depth between seven and 10 meters. And it's where we invite people to do shipbuilding, um, ship manufacturing, and R&D in that space as well. We do have pre-built property solutions. We call them uh, light industrial units. John uh, calls them boutique warehouses. And I think that's actually a bit more appropriate. Um, uh, and we do have 24 of those in Raspo Fantas, ranging from 400 square meters to 1500, <coughs> excuse me, and 54 of them in Umm al-Hul. Um, so these can be, these are turnkey solutions and a lot of our investors are taking them for a variety of different reasons. So we have people doing 3D printing, Volkswagen is doing some R&D in two of these. Um, and so the, ver I mean, it's just a turnkey solution and you can do with it what you will. We haven't actually cut the ribbon on any of our free zones yet. So it's still uh, what I like to call a soft opening and we're almost out of uh, LIUs and Blas and Plus. So the demand has been quite um, high for these. So very quickly, let me just go through the offering for investors. We have a very attractive feedstock. Um, we do, as the free zones in Qatar or, or as the government state of Qatar, provide most of the energy to the region, including the gas that is currently being subsidized in Dubai. Um, that goes through the Dolphin pipeline from here to there. So we do have a very, very attractive feedstock and very favorable energy costs because we are the source. Um, we do uh, uh, look out for a stable environment and co-investment opportunities for all of our um, um, investors if, if, they, if they wish to, to pursue that. And we have a very attractive business environment. So we try to keep things as transparent as possible. And we also do offer the Qatar International Court as a backing for any investors. And what that is, is if an investor has a um, dispute with a local partner or another investor or with us, um, you are protected by English common law through the Qatar International Courts rather than our local judiciary system. Um, some of the incentives are 20 years of tax holidays, zero customs on duties on import, 100% for, foreign ownership and full capital repatriation, no questions asked, access to government-backed funds, world-class service uh, and state-of-the-art facilities that we've built, uh, skilled workforce and joint venture partnership opportunities. We're positioned quite strategically, and it's not only the position, because I think in the Middle East, we do share um, a proximity geographically, but what we have, which John, of course, can elaborate on later, is a very good logistics infrastructure that gives you accessibility to around um, 6 trillion US dollars in combined GDP. So we have had demand from, um, most recently, a Silicon Valley-based re online retailer who wanted to access the East African markets. Um, they actually came to us and uh, the first question I asked was, why'd you come to us? And they said, well, your logistics infrastructure. 
um, we, they wanted to utilize Qatar Airways to get into the East African markets. Of course, Hamid Port is now around four years old and that's seeing a tremendous growth in um, trade volume. Um, and so the logistics infrastructure that we have in Qatar allows our investors to get to uh, six trillion US dollars in combined GDP. Finally, um, how to get started? It's quite simple. Um, you get in touch with the investor email, which um, hopefully will be on the next slide. Uh, do feel free to take a picture of that. And we have included a link for this presentation. Um, we'll talk to you about what it is you want to do and how we can help you grow. And immediately thereafter, uh, we will actually hold your hand through the application process so that you get accepted and um, we register you. So all licenses, all uh, permits, all, all of that is handled in-house. And um, so it's quite a simple process that takes, um, depending on the application and depending on the business, I've seen it uh, done in a week and I've also seen it for very large business take a, take a bit longer. Um, thank you very much for your time and uh, for listening. And I think um, if John and Charlotte want to open their cameras again um, and uh, we, we can have a, an open discussion, I think, to, to address uh, what I've just said. Um, so uh, let, me, let me start by shooting a few questions your way, uh, John. Um, where do you see British businesses, because you are a member of QBBF and British yourself and also uh, a colleague of ours in the free zones, where do you see British businesses being able to expand the most in Qatar? So what, what, what value proposition do you see specifically for British businesses? Well, we offer a wide range of facilities to uh, companies from all countries, but there is something which is quite unique about the, the long relationship that exists between the two countries. Uh, as an example of that, the British Embassy's PO box is, is number three. So we get an idea of how long they have been here. And then the trade that exists between the two countries is quite significant. It's not only the, the energy sector, but it's the uh, other raw materials that Qatar is exporting. And Qatar is also a significant importer of product from the UK. In terms of that logistics relationship, I think we will see uh, Qatar Airways coming back to that same situation that it had prior to the pandemic when there were more than 10 flights a day to the UK. So with those 10 flights, uh, passenger and cargo, there's a tremendously strong logistics link between the two countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I, I think what I'd like to add to that is that the relationship is not only um, old and, and strong, it's being uh, renewed and championed a lot. So I can recall um, being part of a trade delegation that His Highness led, uh, Sheikh Tamim, to London, where um, the Chamber of Commerce here locally will reach out to business entities and local private sector actors and ask them if they want to join. And usually the attendance for something like that is around 50 to 70 representatives of local companies, but for the UK it was around 250. So the trade relationship and the business relationship between Qatar and the UK is, is extremely strong. And, and um, which is why we reached out to, to Charlotte and QBBF to, to curate something here. Um, yes, and ho hopefully in the future we can actually have you in person at some yeah. of our events. Yeah, That's absolutely. Lovely. Yeah. And that relationship flows both ways, doesn't it, Fahad, with the investments yeah. of Qatar and, and the UK? Maybe you could tell us about those. So the, we've invested heavily in the UK in a, in a plethora of businesses, simply because the infrastructure in the UK is is much more is very advanced. It's also extremely secure as an investment, not only from a, a return on investment standpoint and, and the global demand for the UK, but also from the standpoint of the political stability that we have as a, as a, um, as a result of this long relationship. So Qatar has managed to create a very strong fiscal buffer, uh, through, partially through investments in the UK. And that translates directly into our ability to be very selective with the investors that we attract into the free zones. Um, we'll avoid investors that are looking at uh, very high polluting businesses and so on. And it also allows us to take risks on very high potential investors um, that have uh, a smaller capital. 
to, to, to invest. It's partially because of those investments that we put into the UK um, that have give, it's, that's given us this fiscal buffer. It also allows us to maintain our selectivity um, during this crisis of COVID, um, where other countries are looking at huge economic downturns and losses where we are looking at the same, the free zones itself can maintain a, a, uh, a level of, of, of sustainability given the fiscal buffer that we've created largely um, thanks to the UK. Um, so Charlotte, given that, for prospective British investors that want to come into the, U to the free zones or, or, or and expand their businesses in Qatar, how difficult or how easy, what's the process to actually get registered with QBBF? So to get registered with QBBF, it's, it's very simple. It's just an application form that then has to go through um, kind of a panel of review um, to be, to kind of qualify for that. It's, as I said, it's not just British businesses. So similar to you, we're looking to kind of build the network in Qatar. It's not just British businesses. It's people who also trade uh, with the British companies or are looking to start trading with certain British companies. So there's a, there's a whole range of kind of companies we have in our membership base. So some of them are kind of more startup um, things. Some of them are um, kind of massive companies that have come up and set in Qatar. So it is a real range in a, across industries. It's, it's just an application form to make sure that the reasons that for the membership are kind of mutually both work out, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, thank you. And, and Charlotte, what's the, what's the scale of the British community here? Oh, the British community, God, goodness, I don't know. <laughs> I've been here a long time, I don't even know. We've got uh, 300 members. Um, but obviously, those are mainly kind of professional, um, professional individuals or companies who are looking to set up. But in terms of the population, I'm, I'm not actually sure. I'll have to find out. <laughs> Um, when I came to Qatar 18 years ago, it was a lot less. <laughs> the last numbers I saw were, were over 20,000. And, and I think yeah. it speaks to the... To oh, someone's, the answer, yeah, someone's answering for me. Thank you, Daniel. 22,000 Brits, there you go. And um, that speaks to access to a skilled workforce. Yeah, exactly. I mean, most people that are here are here as... Yeah, because they're professionals. Most people come here... As, I guess unless you're coming with a spouse of some sort, um, you are part of a company and being sponsored by a company. Then, we've got a we got a question just coming on what activities will be permitted in yeah. the free zone. So the only activities that we are not allowed to indulge in or even address are those pertaining to tobacco and those pertaining to alcohol. Everything else is taken um, into consideration. So do not hesitate to get in touch if there's anything you want to explore. We will look at everything on a case-by-case -case basis. We never put a blanket policy on all activities or any certain vertical. Um, but we do find that most of the demand that we get as a free zone comes from the logistics sector or the will to kind of utilize the strength of our logistics sector, which of course, John, you're, you're taking care of, and, of, and the access to cheap energy. Um, that's kind of where our strength lies. In addition to that, there is a, a almost guaranteed immediate growth in, in spending or the propensity to spend here locally because of the coming World Cup. Um, currently, the population is at about uh, just around 2 million people here in Qatar. And the World Cup is anticipated to bring in another million. Though for a short amount of time, there's some buildup and then there's some, some downturn thereafter. That significantly increases the business landscape here in Qatar. Um, so a lot of investors are looking to uh, come in and utilize that. And we do work very closely with the Supreme Committee who have referred companies that are startups that have been awarded pilot projects um, with the, um, uh, the upcoming World Cup and to, to run their pilots on some of the stadiums. So yeah, we, we, don't, we don't put a blanket statement on any activities that we allow or we don't allow. And we do see demand a lot in the logistics sector. Before I do address that with you, I do want you to elaborate on that because it is your bread and butter, John. There is a question that came in that asks if we foresee companies based in the free zone being able to trade directly with companies that are registered with the Ministry of Commerce. And yes, absolutely. Um, so when you get a free zone uh, registration with us, you are essentially a Qatari company or a Qatari-based company. So you can trade with whoever you'd like, onshore or offshore. Um, 
it's as simple as that, uh, really. So, John, what kind of demand have you been seeing in the aerospace, marine, and, and logistics uh, cluster? And what is it exactly that usually they're after? What what kind of competitive advantage do they do they usually seek from you? Well, the countries. I mean, it's a great question, whoever asked that. But what the country's done is it's invested appropriately over the last 10 years to create some of the best logistics assets in the world. Um, the award-winning Hamad International Airport, uh, which will be expanded as the ongoing demand is, is pushing it along. Hamad Ocean Port, uh, a $7.5 billion greenfield expansion into a deep water port has made a huge difference. Qatar Airways, which uh, prior to the pandemic had become the largest cargo airline in the world and an award-winning uh, passenger carrier as well, were another piece to the requirement for effective logistics. And that combination, along with opening what is going to be one of the most sustainable free zones in the world, has attracted the logistic company. Yeah, I, I, I am. I, I think I'm looking at some of these questions, and, and they're quite they're quite interesting. So the um, um, one of them is: Will companies be able to access uh, financing? Yes, uh, there are there is a there's a there's a huge uh, array of resources when it comes to that locally. And in addition to that, we have the Doha Venture Capital. Um, company that is a subsidiary of the free zone. So yes, there is, there is access to financing and we're ranked fifth in the world for access to, to financing. Um, will the free zone permit a growth of media activities such as publishing houses, a media city perhaps? So there is a entertainment media city that's being um, set up in Qatar. And just to make this clear, I think, I think this is a good point that, that kind of uh, can lead me to a frequently asked question. What's the relationship between us and QFC, which is a free zone in its own right, or QSTP. Um, and the relationship is that it's, it's, it's a mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship. We've diverted uh, investments that we think fit with QFC to them, and they've done the same. And we've also done that with QSTP and others. Um, and I think we share boards as well. There are board members that are, that are on both. So um, to answer this person's question, uh, do get in touch with us with the investor email and, and we'll help you as much as we can and, and direct you towards the appropriate uh, kind of entity to take care of you. Um, so uh, what are the advantages of setting up in the free zone as opposed to not in the free zone? That's a very good question. I, I, I do want to address it. Maybe you can both jump in here because uh, um, give your best sales pitch. <laughs> yeah, well, Charlotte, you have, I think you, you have a, access to a wide array of British companies that are mostly set up onshore in Qatar or, or within Doha. Um, yeah. And so the, the model that came in through the free zones is that we wanted to see how, where the um, hindrances were in conducting business in Doha and kind of eradicate them for the free zones. So uh, the advantages are that you can own your company as an expat completely if you'd like. Um, and in addition to that, all the licensing, all the permits, all your civil defense, all your anything that you would need from the government, you would get from us. Um, so we do the speaking to the government on your behalf. And you wouldn't need an intermediary to do that. You wouldn't need an intermediary to trade on shore if you wanted to. So there are quite a few advantages to setting up uh, within the free zones rather than onshore, especially if you are an uh, investor that is in Qatar. Right. Um, so we have set it up to help international businesses expand. Um, yeah. Charlotte, maybe you can share some of the um, challenges you've seen onshore and, and see if we've addressed them offshore. I think I think we've addressed most of them. We spent quite a lot of time looking. at. Yeah, I guess, I guess one of the um, my most frequently asked questions or one of the concerns of when setting up is about office space. And obviously, um, this can be a big financial concern as well. So. Um, I guess, is that something? Yeah, we did look into that quite heavily. We have um, some of our investors, one of the free zones, well, we do oversee a few biz, um, buildings in Amshirif, which wasn't in the presentation, but investors like Volkswagen have booked out floors in Amshirif and are still free zone registered entities. Um, in addition to that, we have the Business Innovation Park, which is in Ras Bofan Plus, uh, yeah. state of the art, uh, incredibly, incredibly impressive, um, where we have office space to lease to 
whoever would like it. In addition to that, of course, there's no madhul. And so office space is no issue at all. And you'll find that our prices are quite competitive. Um, yeah. Is there anything you wanted to add to that when it comes to our competitive advantage for foreign businesses? Yeah, I think it, it, it segues nicely into talking about um, how we feel about companies that are in Qatar onshore and them wanting to go into the free zone. Um, and there has been circumstances where we've had that and we've, we've applauded it because companies that are onshore who want to expand internationally, uh, it makes sense for them to have an operation in Qatar and an operation in the free zone. The free zone operation obviously shields them from customs duty so they can bring product in, they can add value to that product, and then they can re-export through Qatar Airways network or, or through the ocean freight network. So there are opportunities for companies to have operations in both onshore and in the free zone, and you can have 100% foreign ownership in the free zone, or if you wish to duplicate the joint, joint venture that you have with your Qatari partner, that can be moved to the free zone as well. Right, but I do wanna stress that, um, as you mentioned, rightfully so, the, that we do encourage people to expand their business into the free zone. Um, we're, so the, again, the goal here is to diversify the economy and not necessarily cannibalize the local market. So if you do have uh, a wish to expand your export portfolio as a company, or you have the wish to maybe dive into another venture here in Qatar, um, we do encourage you to get in touch with us and we'll, we'll take a look at it. And, and that, I mean, there's a, comp there's a, a question here from Mr. Christopher mm -hmm. O'Connor who says, uh, if you have a company registered in QFC, how do you transfer your company to QFC? Um, get in touch with us. We'll, we'll take a look at it. But um, we would have to see the reasons why you want to leave QFC and so on. Uh, and depending on the business, we may be able to help you more than QFC. And, and um, if it's a business where QFC has the mandate, then we'll advise you as well. So do get in touch with us um, and we'll take a look at your case. But it doesn't take, it's not, uh, it's quite an easy process. To move to and we had an example of that with a British company, which is also in the EV sector, who was moving from research to manufacturing. So it made sense for them to move into a facility which was more designed for physical product. And I guess that's another example of clustering. So we currently have VW, AV, EV, autonomous vehicles and electric vehicles. We have Inventus a global manufacturer of lithium ion batteries. We've got the British company that's come in mm -hmm. and we've got, uh, help me on this one, Fahad, we've got another one, haven't we? Yeah, there's, there's quite a few, John. I, I think the- The, Boston, the French company. And, um, the, so most of these big names that we do get in usually do want to utilize either the logistics infrastructure or the cheap energy. And, and a lot of them actually do have bases in Qatar and then expand their business with us. Um, but that was that was good for her because you you touched on a on a point that we sh we should cover. You said that the energy costs here are a are low cost, and that and that's true. So not only are we offering some um, pretty amazing facilities, what you will find is we come into the free zone that the let's say, take the cost of electricity, three and a half cents per kilowatt hour, one of the cheapest in the world, and at the same time one of the most sustainable hydrocarbon sources for electricity. And as much that it's gas, as opposed to dirty coal or, or oil. So we're offering low cost energy. We offer low cost land. We offer low cost warehouses. We have a really good cost of labor if you contrast it to the UK or to Europe. And I think that those, those cost elements make a real difference during what are really hard economic times. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we do have the luxury of being the largest exporter of LNG to the world. Um, and we've made this case over and over again that liquefied natural gas is more sustainable, it's cleaner, and it also um, is uh, due to its, the, the nature of its conversion into energy is the biggest or the most appropriate energy source to use when you're uh, creating renewable energy. Or, or introducing renewable energy into your merit order, uh, which is the, the supply chain of, of, of energy sources. Um, let's shift gears. We are still in oil and gas territory. Can you give a brief idea on the oil and gas company started operating from free zones? John, do you want to touch on the Teltine initiative? 
Yeah, I'd love to. So when an energy company wants to relocate into the free zone from an international location, whether it's close by or whether it's in Europe or the US, they will be recognized by the, the state uh, petroleum company, QP, as a Qatari company, as producing uh, in-country value, which means that you have an advantageous qualification for QP contracts, Qatar gas contracts, and all of these uh, contracts out there. As a consequence, we uh, announced uh, at the end of last year that, that a, a very large uh, Malaysian energy company, Wesco Piping, Wesco Energy, sorry, uh, had come into the free zone, uh, and their investment is significant. So we have in the pipeline now energy companies coming to set up somewhere in the late teens, close to 20. Yeah, and, and so again, we work very closely with all stakeholders in the country, QP, Supreme Committee, all of these guys included to make sure that if you do want to serve them or if you want to get in touch with them, we localize your business in a way that makes sense for, for you and for us. There's a question here um, from Manish Pandey, um, the, the, who wants to address the visa issue. Um, they, well, there are complicated job change processes for professionals in Qatar and, and companies that want to come in. What are the visa requirements and so on? All of that is taken care of in-house. Um, again, so your visas, your permits, your licenses, all of that we take care of in-house. And within your application, as you apply for the free zones, you'll tell us what kind of skilled labor you'll need and what kind of unskilled labor you'll need. And we'll address that with our um, team that's located in Rasko Fantas and they'll take care of you. So again, you don't have to speak to anyone. It's not complicated at all. We'll, we'll take care of that. Um, uh, cool. There's another question from uh, one of our members actually. Uh, do companies who set up in the Qatar free zone have access to something similar to the Qatar International Court or Dis Dispute Resolution Center um, yeah. like they would have in the Qatar Financial Center? Absolutely, yeah. So we share that. Qatar Financial Center was the pioneer of that initiative. And we uh, advertise it heavily in our, in, our, um, in our decks and anytime we speak to an investor, just to make sure that they feel secure in, in speaking yeah. to us, uh, knowing that they're protected should there be any dispute. But we haven't, we haven't seen any disputes yet, thankfully. No. It's been good. Fingers um, crossed, it stays that way. <laughs> yeah. And there is one advantage I think you discovered, Farhad, for British companies. They get to have British law in Qatar. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and in terms of the, um, I think it's also a question uh, from some, which types of business is kind of best to set up in the QF um, free zone? Um, I know that you've mentioned a few obviously big names. Um, are there any companies that you would say it's probably not worth or that there's certain industries that are more suited or is it really just everyone? Um, there's a success story uh, that I'd like to share. There was a very I mean, medium sized. They had maybe 11 employees, um, uh, company, ICT based company um, that, that approached us at one of our roadshows and uh, wanted to set up in the free zones. They provide cloud services and they also do predictive artificial intelligence. Medium sized, 10, 11 people. They came into the free zones with, I think, three people a managing director for Qatar and then two people to kind of help him uh, with the groundwork. And Within three months, that investor, that managing director called me and said that they were named official partners of Microsoft here. And what I'm, so that's a massive, I mean, success story for a company that's quite small compared to Microsoft. And the way they were able to achieve that is by realizing that what they were offering in this market um, was, was not offered by anyone other than them. It's a very, very young market, especially when it comes to emerging technologies mm -hmm. and when it comes to things that are um, disruptive in, in, on a global uh, scale. Um, so any company, no matter what size, will find that there's a space for them in Qatar. And you'll also find that you are first movers if you move now. Um, we are getting the message out uh, as, as quickly as we can. But right now, there, there is a lot of space for growth, especially in these emerging tech clusters. John, is there, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, that was an awesome uh, start because if you look at the other end of the spectrum, we've got Microsoft opening a data center in the free zones. We've got Google opening a data center in the free zones. 
So we, we've got this wide range of attracting small startups and attracting you know, global leaders in tech. And the depth of tech that we're looking at, ag tech, biotech, health tech, energy tech, clean tech, and we're supporting that uh, sometimes with uh, Doha Venture Capital, which mm -hmm. focuses on these type of disruptive technologies. But disruptive technologies are really going everywhere now. And we're seeing that in logistics, we're seeing it in medicine, we're seeing it in a lot of different places. Yeah, and I think in addition to that, any business that comes in that's, that supports the vision that we published, the 2030 Qatar vision. So there's, a, there's an abundance of, of resources in the country and we've been fortunate with that. But what we don't have is um, things like agriculture. So any, any disruptive technology in that space uh, that contributes to the supply of food or that contributes to the more sustainable supply of energy or that contributes to the, a more sustainable um, environment. Um, these, these businesses are welcome with open arms, uh, really, regardless of the size. So there's a lot of space, um, especially for businesses that are innovative. And, 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 and we're also seeing growth in, in the other industries which we're focusing on. So logistics is a core skill set and we're attracting all the logistics companies that are coming in. They're either signed up or on their way. Aerospace is very important to us. So we're building an aerospace cluster on two kilometers of lands, uh, two kilometers, two, two thousand, sorry, two million square meters of land at Ras Bifontes. Um, we're focusing on the maritime sector, as I had mentioned before. So we have close proximity to Hamid port at Amul Hall Free Zone, and we have our own dedicated service port, Masa port, inside Amul Hall Free Zone. Is, is, that, is that port op open? Is it? Is it yeah. It's, it's wet, but it's uh, not operating just yet. Right, okay. So it's, it's ready to go. Um, all of the equipment is working and we're just putting the uh, regulatory framework around it now. Yeah. Okay, nice. Quite a bit of demand, for it, haven't we? Um, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, um, it's, it's been quite a bit of demand for Mercer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have a, a, few, a few other questions which um, I think are kind of similar in nature. So if you are a company in the free zone, are you able to bid on projects? Um, are you able to kind of get government contracts even if you, don't, if you not have a local 51% country partner? Yes, you are and we encourage it. So please do bid while you're within the, the registered with us. And we hope you win because your success means that we're more sustainable. So we encourage it. Not only are you allowed to. Okay. We got a follow up question on, on energy. So mm -hmm. Uh, what is the Northfield expansion, Fahad? Could you, could you talk to that? Yeah, the Northfield expansion is just an expansion on the current moratorium of um, gas that we produce. Um, we used to export 77 million tons per annum. Mm -hmm. uh, that's then expanded to uh, 110 million tons per annum. And that's been expanded again to, I think, 124. So we're by far the largest exporter of natural gas in the world, making us the swing producer. Um, and of course, uh, that contributes greatly to the amount of business that you can find within the oil and gas field. Because these expansions are taking place, you went from 77 to, to, to 124 million tons per annum. That's a huge leap. Um, and again, once, once they, especially QP, if they make that commitment, it's going to happen. And so there's a, a massive increase in business opportunities on that end as well. And again, ideally positioned for, for British companies with their experience in, in the field that they have sent it out of Aberdeen. Um, and of course, all going ahead, confirmed with the purchase, uh, with the purchase order for new LNG carriers to the tune of $20 billion. That's right. Yeah. It's also why I, I like, to, I like that, that small story I gave you very early on in the presentation, the British man that actually took a risk and discovered oil here and we call him the father of oil. The British have been just just crucial in the development of our oil fields. Um, you can still see the, the thumbprint of some of these British companies, BP in particular, Shell is partially British um, in QP. So the, I mean that relationship between that sector and, and, and the UK is, is extremely val valuable. And I've got a question that came in here um, about the differentiation. How do we differentiate QFZ from other free zones in the region? Well, 
their strategy is their strategy. But what I can say from our perspective that there's probably three key ones. I talked to one before, which was about cost. Mm -hmm. We're very competitively priced across utilities and across land. Number two, stability. Uh, Moody's have confirmed Qatar's credit rating at A3, which is one of the highest in the world. And then the third one, and I think one of the most important one, is sustainability. Fahad talking about his children and his grandchildren. And our focus as a free zone is to preserve the natural flora and fauna. So we protect it in, in nurseries. We encourage solar energy usage. All of the irrigation water is recycled. And we're using extensive data analytics to ensure that the resource consumption is kept at its lowest level. So thank you for that question. It's a good one. Yeah. We have another one about um, when trading with Qatar, how will taxes and duty be dealt with? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if you are, so all customs duties and import duties have been omitted for companies within the free zone. But the moment you start competing onshore, all local laws apply. Now, let me, let me elaborate very quickly. You can still maintain 100% ownership of your company within the free zones and trade onshore, right? But the tax laws that would be, um, that would exist on shore will still apply. Um, you can even be situated outside of these free zones, outside of Raspa from Plaza Numul Hul, you could be situated in Mshirab like, like Volkswagen is. But they maintain 100% ownership of that project that they have and conduct all of their business on shore when it comes to that autonomous vehicle deployment. Um, but they are still subject to all local tax laws, which are quite low, I think, uh, compared to the region. Um, I think, uh, with the exception of one country in the GCC, we're the lowest uh, when it comes to that. We've got a question about, uh, as the QFZ working with QCB on the potential fintech sandbox, and do you see fintech being a core offering of QVC? I think that'd be more QFC, wouldn't it, Fahad? Right, yeah, that's right. So QFC has the mandate, and I think they have much more experience than we do. Um, in hosting financial service companies, which would include fintech um, companies. So, I mean, do get in touch with us and we can direct you to them if you'd like, um, or we can take a look at, and, at your business and advise you. But yeah, QFC has the mandate for financial technologies and financial services. And if I had another question here, maybe you want to have a go at this one. Companies placed in QFZ will be able to bid for PPP projects in Qatar? As local companies too? Yes, absolutely. And we encourage it, please, by all means. Yeah. When will uh, Qatar Free Zone be fully operational is the question we have. Well, uh, we'll announce it. Um, we are, the, the, we've only, I've been here for around a year. John has been here for around a year. I think we're maybe a month yep. apart or so. Um, the first employee has been here for maybe two years. So we're, we're building very quickly. Um, and we do have a, quite a, a loaded pipeline of, of demand for investors. Um, Umm al will be announced very soon, so do keep an eye out for that. We are announcing the opening of Umm al very soon. And um, hopefully within this year, everything will be fully up and running. So we have uh, Do Doha Craft is, is active manufacturing boats in Umm al Free Zone. And if you drive past Vespa Fontes Free Zone, you'll see a DHL facility uh, approaching completion, another facility for Gulf warehousing and UPS approaching completion, and uh, occupation of the offices for our clients will be in the next month. So yeah, we're, we're really excited about doing a, a, completing the soft launch and then celebrating uh, the success of the team that has built this freezer. Yeah, yeah. For sure. I think I didn't do a great job in actually keeping my slide up for long enough. There's a, there's a bit of demand here for the contact details on who can assist me for the registration of my new company. So let me, let me go ahead and, and, and keep that up rather than our pictures, uh, John. If you want. <laughs> and what we'll also do is we'll send a link to your registered email address uh, so that you can get a copy of this presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think a few people have asked about how you can maybe get advice. So um, that email is investors at fza.gov.qa. So it's on the, it's on the PowerPoint. Um, and I guess 
that email will our members will be able to kind of access and maybe get some advice on their queries. Is that correct, Fahad? Yeah, that's right. So you could do investors at FZ or FZA, or you could do investors at QFZ. Uh, we own. That. Okay. Okay. Perfect. And um, as I said, hopefully John and Fahad will be in person at some of our events where maybe you can ask any specific questions um, relating to your uh, companies to them there. I'm sure you'll probably have a long line. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> well, no, I mean, we're happy to do it. <laughs> yeah. This is the we could. Part of it. Well, if you're doing road shows, I was going to say that would um, maybe be quite good for our, our members at QBBF. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is the fun part of the job for both of us, I think, is actually yeah. to, to, to see what the questions are, where the concerns lie, so we can do our job um, more effectively, I think. Perfect. Well, I think, I think we've answered um, the majority of questions. So thank you very much. I think we've had um, an array of questions of different, um, different sorts. Uh, so thank you so much for kind of imparting your wisdom on us and sharing um, a little bit more about the Qatar free zone. I think for a lot of us who have been in Qatar for a long time, it's one of those things that yeah. you'd hear talked about a lot, but you don't actually know the ins and outs. So it's been really, really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, we will share share the PowerPoint with anyone that wants it from the email address. So thank you very much to John Fahad and we hope to meet you in person very soon. Yeah, thank you, Charlotte. Thank you for organizing this and thank you for, for being here with us. Really, we appreciate it. Hopefully and it's the first of many, first of many collaborative events. And thank you very much for the attention of our audience and uh, those valuable questions that they asked. Yeah, really good questions. We were nervous, they wouldn't have any and we had a lot. So thank you so much. <laughs> Great. Have a, have, have a good uh, evening, everyone, and see you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye.